Okay, it looks like it's uh, 0900 hours. Let's go ahead and uh, get everybody off of mute and uh, show yourselves if you can, if you'd like to. You're decent. And uh, let's go ahead and start the regular Board of Retirement meeting for uh, Wednesday, July 6th. Thank you, Chair Pryor. This meeting is being held virtually, so I will do a roll call of the trustees to confirm attendance, starting with Mr. Knox. Mr. Knox? Sorry, I'm here. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Santos. President on the call for. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Present. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. Present. Mr. Robbins. I'm here. Mr. Harris. I'm present. Mr. Bernstein. I'm here. And Chair Pryor. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Ms. Zapanta will not be joining us today. Staff participating in the meeting includes CEO Santos Kreiman, Deputy CEO <laughs> Lucas Lugo, Assistant Executive Officers JJ Papa with Laura Guglielmo, Chief um, Audit Executive Richard Bendel, CIO uh, John Grable, Chief Counsel Stephen Rice, Senior Staff Counsel Frank Boyd and Christine Roslin, Legislative Affairs Officer uh, Barry Liu, Disability Litigation Staff include Vincent Lim, Allison Barrett, and Jason Waller. Staff and managers participating today include Carly Natoya, Kathy Delino, Delano, uh, Ted Granger, Barry Liu, Cassandra Smith, Ricky Contreras, Tamara Caldwell, Vicki Neely, Carrie Wilson, Hernan Barrientos, Ricardo Salinas, Carlos Barrios, Alan Cochran, Gerald Bukakia, Bukakao, uh, Valerie Kiros, and uh, Renee Copeland. Lacera's medical advisor, Dr. Glenn Erisman, will also be joining us today, and legislative advocates, Tony Rhoda and Shane uh, Dowsett. Uh, trustees, please use the Zoom chat option to be placed in the queue. At this time, we ask all meeting participants to mute their mics until you are ready to speak, and now we may proceed with the agenda. Thank you. That brings us to the first order of business, and that will be the approval of minutes of the regular meeting of June 1st, 2022. I'll move it. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Harris, second by Mr. Robbins. Mr. Roll, please. Great. Mr. Knox? Aye. Ms. Gray? Aye. Mr. Santos? Yes. Mr. Sanchez? Yes. Mr. Moore? Aye. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Mr. Robbins? Aye. And Mr. Bernstein? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Bonnie. That brings us to public comment. Uh, no request. I'm sorry. No request today. Thank you. We have no written uh, or verbal request for public comment. And that brings us to other communications. That means the May 2022 all May 2022 all stars. Mr. Popovich. Well, thank you very much, um, Chair Breyer and uh, good morning trustees. This is the portion of the meeting where we take a moment and recognize those staff members that have gone above and beyond the call of duty to help their fellow staff members or members. So please help me in congratulating Michael Romero, Ching Fong, Diana Luong, Jackson Hu, and Jonathan Grable. And hey. pictures there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. And number two, we have Chief Executive, uh, the Chief Executive Officer Report, and we have an attached memo and Mr. Uh, Mr. Kreiman. Yes, um, thank you, Chair Pryor. Good morning, trustees uh, and staff. Just wanted to give you a, a brief update on um, a couple of items. The staff report uh, is self-explanatory. and be more than happy to answer any questions about the report, but I did wanna let you know that we did receive an updated schedule for the election, um, our safety members election. And so we will be providing uh, that particular um, schedule to the trustees um, following the meeting. Um, the uh, election again is um, August 5th through the 31st. There will be a series of five reminder notices that will be coming from the executive office to our safety members to uh, encourage them to vote. Um, they're anticipating that the, uh, the final results of the, uh, the election will be provided no later than September 2nd. And so we continue to work with them to develop um, 
uh, information to send to our uh, our impacted uh, members uh, on the election. And so we'll continue to work with them um, as the election moves forward. Uh, cost of living adjustments. Um, the Board of Supervisors did approve unanimously the uh, the uh, both the contracts, uh, the MOU, and also the um, the recommendation or the um, I'm sorry, the approval by the Board of Retirement, the Board of Investments on uh, non-represented uh, uh, pay increases and and uh, benefits. Um, so the second reading of the ordinance will be held for non-reps on the next Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Uh, once we have that uh, approval secured, uh, we'll begin to uh, process all of the cost of living adjustments. Uh, we're moving forward with trying to process the uh, cost of living adjustments for our uh, represented employees as quickly as possible. And so I do have a call into the Auditor Controller's Office to help facilitate that uh, and expedite that as quickly as possible. Um, those really are the, the two items that um, I wanted to uh, highlight for you. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have on the report. You have the executive officer's report in front of you. Are there any questions? Mr. Saunders. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning, Mr. Kreiman. Morning. Yeah, so I continue to be... Um, Got it. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I continue to be concerned about the pace of the recruitment. You know, I, I appreciate the report you've given us uh, as part of you see or report, but I'm, I'm really uh, confused and disappointed uh, with regards to the principal investment officer. Uh, it's recruitment stage is not applicable. Uh, senior investment officer on a sign. That doesn't give me comfort, uh, Mr. Kreiman. Uh, it doesn't seem, from my perspective, uh, that we are making uh, much progress, or at least this doesn't tell me the progress, especially when I see uh, that we haven't even beginning to interview. There's no report. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe it's not part of the report. Uh, but I don't, I don't see anybody being interviewed, or there's no report to, to that effect with regards to. Uh, the um, real estate uh, principal investment officer, uh, it, this, these two individuals uh, retired about 15 months ago. And I don't see a report saying, you know, we interview five people, you know, we're down to three finalists or something like that. There's, there's nothing to that effect. I am also very concerned that we haven't been able to initiate the recruitment to replace Mr. David Shu. I would like to remind all, everybody, all my colleagues here and everyone that Mr. Shu's contribution is tremendous. He was the head of the secondary market strategy that we use on the Board of Investments where we received over 60% return in one year, 60% return. Now this is a very important strategy and I'm really, really concerned that we are so behind. So. My question to you, Mr. Kreiman, by, by what metrics should I be holding you accountable? Because I'm, I'm just uh, losing my mind here because I don't see any progress whatsoever. Uh, and so I wanna know uh, by what metrics should this board uh, be uh, holding you accountable for? So, I, I think that the, um, the, you should be holding me to the highest standard, quite frankly. And so um, I, I will stipulate that we are not moving as quickly as I would have liked. And I don't think that there's anyone more frustrated about this whole process than Mr. Grable and myself um, and our executive team and Carly for that matter. So there are a number of steps that we have to go through that we are del deliberately going through. We've um, asked uh, Mr. Grable to assist us with, um, with uh, looking at the, um, the resumes as we go through um, so that we can schedule interviews. The, um, I don't wanna make any excuses. Um, 
So we are working diligently. I don't want you to think that we're not working on this and it's not a priority for us because it is. Um, I think that um, that Mr. Mr. Lugo might be able to give you a little bit better sense of what um, the process is and Carly and Laura are here as well. And then I'm sure that Mr. Grable, if you wanna to talk directly to him, he'd be more than happy to, um, to talk about uh, about this. Now, we, we, we definitely, are are moving in the right direction. Um, we're not moving as quickly as we would like, um, but um, maybe Mr. Lugo, you might want to uh, kind of give us a, a brief update on uh, where we are with at least the PIO position, uh, and Carly may be able to help with that, and Laura as well. Yeah, Mr. Kreiman, and again, Trustee Santos, thank you for your comments. And, and I think we can all agree we're not being as um, expeditious as possible in terms of our recruitment efforts. You know, I will say to Mr. Kreiman's point, there is progress being made week to week. There is communication week to week with um, John, uh, John Grable's staff. What I would like is for uh, Ms. Natoya to just run through the um, senior um, investment officer for real estate, that recruitment and other recruitment efforts to give you kind of an idea. It's not, it's not explained in the CEO report in detail, but uh, it gives you an idea in terms of some of the processes that we're going through to get to that stage of getting a qualified list of candidates to be able to interview. But um, Ms. Notoria, if you can go through some of those critical recruitments that we're hey, let, let me cut in real quick here. Um, just to keep a matter of decorum and make sure some of the traditions that we have in our board and we're following Robert's rules appropriately, let's make sure when we ask, um, say if we have a agenda item that we're asking a question that it goes through the chair and if we're asking somebody to speak, that it also goes through the chair. Oh. Those are important issues because I do try and control the conversation. And if we have too much back and forth where one person is asking the next person to speak, it doesn't really lend itself to establishing that control. So if we can, please ask people to request to speak through the chair. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Pryor. And with that, Ms. Natoya. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So um, a overview of the recruitments. Our current priorities are the senior investment officer for real estate um, the, and four, uh, three financial analyst positions. So we have a total of four investment exams open right now. The finance analyst positions are in um, portfolio, portfolio analytics, corporate governance, and real estate. Uh, so those are the four exams. So senior investment officer was open first, and that one is the furthest along. We have evaluated 2019. Uh, we have evaluated the evaluation of training and experience for 19 applicants, and uh, staff is currently reviewing the scores that were submitted by um, two investments readers. Also, uh, finance analyst three in portfolio analytics, uh, the raters in investments have also submitted their rating sheets and they are being uh, reviewed and then entered into the system. Those two lists will probably be promulgated uh, fairly quickly uh, since we have the most uh, information and complete rating records for them. Uh, as of current, as of today, we don't have the uh, rating evaluations for the FA3 in real estate or the FA3 in corporate governance. These exams continue to be open, so they are continuous exams. So we have already, for example, on the SIO evaluated 20, and since then we've received like another 20 or 30 applications that are going through the process. So the list will continue to be, uh, names will continue to be added uh, to the eligible list, even after the first set is promulgated, up until we close the exam. We won't close the exam until uh, investment has decided that they have enough uh, qualified candidates and wish to suspend the recruitment. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Santos. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, through the chair, I would like to uh, request that uh, uh, for uh, Mr. Grable, if he has any comments about uh, this recruitment, in particular in his division, because I am very concerned. Any any comments to that effect? Uh, well, we, we've we've basically taken a report and carried it on to what's really become a what's probably necessary to be an agenda item. So I'm 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 very apprehensive to do that. 
mainly because I don't know if that's uh, allowed. Um, the agenda item was the chief executive Off officer report. We're starting to divert our way into the uh, weeds on a, uh, a, a recruitment issue. And I'm starting to feel uncomfortable about that. I see Mr. Rice has a, has a learned opinion. I say, I say, uh, that's fine, Mr. No. Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate you, you ruling. Uh, so I therefore uh, uh, request that this item be placed on the agenda for the next board of retirement meeting uh, with as an action item. Uh, so that way uh, we can spend the necessary time uh, to discuss this matter and take any action necessary because I am not satisfied and, and, and very concerned with the pace that uh, we are taking to uh, replace these uh, key positions. So that's my request and we can move forward, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'm fine with that request. And I, I request that we actually uh, make it broad enough that we have all key positions, not the, not just those related to the Board of Investments and that this be an agenda item that we have a update a manager's update regarding um, the uh, uh, recruitment of uh, senior officers. So, uh, Mr. Kehoe. Uh, thank you. I, I'm fine with the direction that we're going with this, but I'm curious for uh, Mr. Rice if he could comment on this, because I thought that this was okay within the Brown Act to have a conversation um, about an item that was covered in the CEO's report. Uh, we didn't make any actionable motions and we've been talking about uh, the status of, of an event. So Mr. Rice, can you provide some comments? Yes, uh, Chair Prior. Chair, please, please, Mr. Rice, through the chair, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Chair Pryor, Mr. Keogh, trustees, uh, it's my view that the discussion so far, including the uh, question that, that uh, uh, Trustee Santos asked to be directed through the chair to Mr. Grable are all within the scope of the uh, discussion that's presented in the Chief Executive Officer's report. And so we are within the bounds of the agenda item and the Brown Act at this point in time. The CEO's report um, lists all the positions that are being discussed, gives there the number of vacancies, the priority and the recruitment stage. And these are all the things that we're talking about and the questions have covered. So I believe that so far, uh, 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 we are well within the bounds of the Brown Act and, and could continue to have some uh, additional discussion within the, the uh, subject matters that are, that are listed in the CEO's report. I guess my, the basis for my uncomfortableness <laughs> is, is that um, we're sort of getting to the point where somebody's gonna make a motion. Uh, we're getting to the point where we're asking staff to speculate because they're not prepared to, this is a, you know, there, there's multiple issues within the chief executive officer's report. I can't expect staff to be uh, prepared to answer all of those. And I'll, I'll say that I have two, two reasons why I'd like this to be an agenda item rather than a roaming dialogue based off an, uh, an executive memo. First is I feel uncomfortable because this is going to turn into a motion and we can't have a motion based on this chief executive officer report. And second is staff is unprepared to answer these questions. I think there is a lot of time that needs to go into answering something that is this intricate as uh, uh, Ms. The, the issues that Mr. Uh, Santos has brought forward. And so without there being an emergency issue, I think this can be an agenda item for the next meeting. If there is an emergency issue, if there is some reason why this issue cannot take a whole month, I need to hear it now and I need to hear it from the CEO and CIO and I will appoint, gladly appoint somebody to an ad hoc committee uh, that can uh, uh, relate to this issue during the interim or we can have a joint board meeting or we can have uh, some other emergency meeting that'll allow us to take action. So if anybody has uh, wants to discuss the uh, uh, timing of this, I'm open to it. If there's no discussion on the timing, I would prefer that this be an agenda item. Mr. Santos. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my request remains that this might be uh, placed on the agenda for next uh, meeting as an action item. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. And and it is. I I, I totally agree with that. I would love a report on on the status of those positions. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, comments, concerns on the chief executive officer report? Thank you. And that uh, brings us to item five, and that's the disability application, disability retirement applications on the consent calendar. The first page for the disability retirement consent calendar is safety, sheriffs. This will be items 730 through 751, with the exception of one of these was pulled and then not pulled. Which one was that, Mr. Harris? 41D, Anthony Rivera was pulled. And 735 is remaining on the, on the consent calendar. That is correct. Okay. So we're pulling 741D. And that is uh, Anthony Rivera. I uh, make a motion for page one and two. With the exception of 741D, which has been which has been moved. Correct. Second. We have a motion. Second. second. We have a second by Mr. Robbins. Yes, Mr. Knox. Aye. Ms. Gray. I have a thumbs up from Ms. Gray. Mr. Santos? Yes. Mr. Sanchez? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Keo. Aye. Mr. Robbins? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. The motion passes unanimously by all trustees present. And uh, Chair Pryor, on 741D, was that pulled for discussion today? Or was or for additional staff development? Oops. That was pulled. for discussion today. Okay, okay, thank you. And we have pages three and four. This is safety, fire, and lifeguard. 18, 1485 through 1500 B. Underwood through Broadwell. And motion by Pryor. Second. Second by Mr. Robbins. Mr. Knox. Aye. Ms. Gray? Thumbs up. Mr. Santos? Yes. Mr. Sanchez? Aye. Mr. Moore? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Robbins? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Pryor? Aye. The motion passes unanimously by all trustees present. Thank you. That brings us to the safety consent calendar. This is page five and six. Case 2400C, Michael Mata through 2411C, Dominique Goff. I'll move. Second. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the motion. Did you catch it, Bonnie? Yes, Mr. Knox um, made the motion and Mr. Robin seconded. Thank you. Roll call now, Mr. Knox? Aye. Ms. Gray? Aye. Mr. Santos? Yes. Mr. Sanchez? Welcome back to you, Mr. Sanchez. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Mr. Robbins? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Sanchez? Okay, the motion passes unanimously by all trustees present. Thank you, Bonnie. That brings us to, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Consent items. Uh, Starting with consent item six, agenda item six. We've had, have we had any late polls, Bonnie, from the consent agenda? We have not. Okay. Move so F. We have a motion, A through F. We have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Second. Bernstein. And Bernstein. Mr. Knox. Aye. Ms. Gray. Aye. Mr. Santos. Uh, I, I may have a question with regards to 
Um, no, never mind. I don't have no questions on these animals. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez. I'll come back to you, Mr. Sanchez. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Kehoe? Aye. Mr. Robbins? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Sanchez? Okay, the motion passes uh, by all trustees present. Thank you, Bonnie. And so we have two presentations coming uh, under reports, but I did have uh, Bonnie pull report item G, which is the monthly travel and education report. Uh, I had received some uh, inquiries regarding this agenda item, if we can go to it. Uh, the questions regarding the travel and education report were, and I don't know, maybe I missed something at a committee meeting, but we did have, this used to be travel and education for trustees and staff. Now this is showing trustee education and travel only. Uh, and I did want to uh, uh, call Mr. Kreiman to yes, go through this agenda item and, and let us know the change. Okay. Um, Chair Pryor, uh, back in 2019, the, uh, the Board of Retirement um, and Board of Investments discussed the Mosaic Report. And in the Mosaic Report, um, there was a recommendation by the consultant to separate the travel policy for trustees and the travel policy for um, staff. And um, the recommendation, and there was a lot of discussion about uh, whether or not the uh, information should be included in the report, the recommendation uh, in the CEO report, or the, if the staff information should be included in the report. Um, and I believe that um, the board decided not to uh, include it, that it was gonna be separate apart, that the CEO would take care of the staff travel. Uh, we were gonna develop our own policy, which we are in the process of, of, uh, of doing. For staff, we're using the old policy at this particular point in time and using the, the Board of Investment, I'm sorry, the uh, trustees policy mm -hmm. as a guide at this particular point in time. Now that we have new staff, there are going to be new approvals that are going to be included, as well as the software that we're trying to implement that will provide uh, more detailed reports in real time on travel for trustees as well as our staff. So that was my recollection. Um, that it would be separate from the report that would be going to the board. Mr. Kehoe. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm fine with uh, the CEO taking on full responsibility for oversight of travel um, that he's ultimately approving within his own budget. So it sounds like that's the direction uh, that we're going so that we would just monitor our own travel and CEO would take full responsibility for that. So if that's the direction, I'm in support of it. Mr. Bernstein. I actually have a different take. Uh, this report is not a part of the policy. It's just a report on, uh, for transparency on what's going on. I have no problem uh, with the CEO being the authority for staff travel, but I don't understand why the report wouldn't come to us as part of a series of reports that give us information on what's going on in the organization. Mr. Santos. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Kiho. I think uh, this is uh, something that uh, it is the responsibility of the CEO and uh, we need to hold them accountable as, as, as such, uh, but that should be delegated to the uh, CEO. He is responsible for uh, running and managing the uh, operations, including the staff. So that should be his prerogative. If there is an issue, uh, there should be a report at some point, maybe an annual report or maybe every six months, uh, let in the, maybe through the operations and oversight committee uh, to uh, let us know uh, uh, or a brief report on the, the staff travel. Uh, it is, from my perspective, I am interesting to see um, whether or not the staff is um, beginning to um, 
uh, have meetings outside the building, uh, in person, and things of that nature. So, uh, but uh, again, this is something that should be uh, the, uh, under the purview of the CEO and uh, perhaps a report through the uh, Operations and Oversight Committee on an uh, uh, annual or biannual uh, basis. Thank you. Um, if I could just speak to this uh, real quick, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of worried that we're confusing authority versus report out. Um, I don't see this as, a, as authority. I, I think that has been delegated appropriately. Again, I think it's completely appropriate that the CEO and or CI in conjunction with the chief investment officer are uh, approving uh, from start to finish all travel. I'm there, but this is not approval. This is nothing, this is a report. And I, you know, I feel way more comfortable when either monthly or quarterly, I'm receiving a report of staff travel. And as I, I think it's been a very long time, fortunately, since we've gotten hammered by the press due to staff and, and or trustee travel, but it's happened and partly we deserved it. And I think that um, trustee oversight over travel is very important. I don't want to authorize. I don't feel that it is, it is within our classification to approve travel in any way for staff. I wanna make sure everybody understands I'm saying that, but oversight is important. And rather than having to make public records requests to see staff travel, I'd rather see it through a monthly and or quarterly report quarterly would be fine. That's made to the full board. I, I'm, I, uh, I'm fairly, uh, uh, you know, I, I really do want this to happen. So uh, is there any other comment, questions, concerns? Mr. Kreiman, is that uh, uh, okay with the staff's uh, uh, duties to report this out quarterly? Yeah, we don't, we don't have a problem reporting it out on a quarterly basis. Um, we, we we get the reports anyway. I, I review them on a monthly basis, but quarterly would be would be okay. We're, we'll more than uh, be happy to provide a, the annual report uh, in the next uh, the next meeting because we we do track it by fiscal year. Thank so, you. Um, we can definitely make that adjustment if that's uh, the desire of the uh, of the chair and the uh, and the trustees. Yeah, I. I'd like to see it at least quarterly, unless anybody has any other uh, uh, requests. I, I welcome the annual report uh, next board meeting. I believe that's what Mr. Kreiman offered. Yes. And then quarterly thereafter, or just just annually, quarterly thereafter. Okay. What, whatever the trustees desire, we can do it monthly, quarterly, biweekly, whatever you want. So, um, so quarterly would be preferred. Quarterly seems quarterly seems simple and prudent. It, it, there's not going to be th these bills are not usually discussed. It's just transparency, which for travel has always been a priority of the organization. Thank you, Alan. All right, that's it. Brings us to our pr two presentations. Uh, I don't know which order you have these in. Why don't we just uh, call on staff to. Who's, uh, who's first? Uh, yes, good morning, uh, Chair Pryor and trustees. Uh, so I think first up is our federal legislative advocates. Uh, they were last here in December. So I'd like to welcome back uh, uh, Tony Rhoda from Williams and Jens and Shane Doucet from uh, Doucet Consulting Solutions uh, to provide us an uh, update on uh, what's going on in uh, federal matters. So um, I will be driving the slides. So I'll put that up in a second. And Mr. Rhoda, there he is. Good morning, Mr. Rhoda. Good morning, Chair Pryor and trustees and staff. Uh, thank you, Barry. Um, yes, we're glad to be here to give you an update as to where things stand in uh, confused Washington at the moment. Barry, you can go to that first slide, the SECURE Act 2.0. I'm going to talk about retirement policy. I'm going to leave plenty of time for Shane because there are some uh, very recent developments on health care. Uh, as, as, as recent as today that I know you're gonna wanna hear. Um, and then at the end, if we have time, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
political positioning for Lacera in the uh, next Congress. Of course, we don't know what that's going to be, but we have some some rough idea. So, um, Barry, you can. I'm going to talk about each of these five areas, starting with the Secure Act, and you can go to that slide. Uh, it is very likely, I would say at this point, that new federal legislation dealing with tax laws related to retirement will be enacted in this Congress. It may not be until the lame duck session, and I would say it's more likely than not to occur in the lame duck session. What we have now, and these, the slide is is a little uh, dated, it reflects only the House provisions, but the, uh, the main House bill is H.R. 2954, and it's been approved by the full House. In the Senate, uh, two committees, the HELP Committee, which is the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and the Finance Committee, a separate committee, have each reported uh, legislation on retirement. Now these bills you will see in articles and, and various media accounts all have different names, <clears throat> but they all basically are under the umbrella of the generic name Secure 2.0. The original Secure Act was enacted, you probably recall back at the end of 2019. So this is follow-up legislation. And as I said, um, expected to, to go the distance and, and make it to President Biden's desk. So some of the key provisions here, uh, all the major legislation here would raise, raise the required minimum distribution age trigger to 75. Now that age was just moved in the original SECURE Act from 70 and a half to 72. This change, um, in the House bill is a graduated change over time, over this 10 year period to get us from uh, where we are today, 72 to 75. I think what happened in between the House action and the Senate committee action is that a number of plans went to the Senate and said, look, this is gonna cause us a lot of internal implementation issues if we have to move the age three separate times. So in the Senate bill, you'll see that it goes to age 75 after beginning in calendar year 2032. So it's just one move and, and plans can uh, plan for that. So that's one of the major provisions in the legislation. Congress seems to be quite enamored with the idea of pushing the age trigger back and back, um, which you know begs the question, are these really retirement plans or are they estate planning tools? I think Congress has made up their mind uh, in which direction they're leaning. So I wouldn't expect it to move from 75, but that's where it will probably settle. There are other provisions on overpayments that plans may make to participants trying to provide more flexibility. There are some, similarities but differences. So I think we have to kind of wait and see on that and, and you know then analyze that language. For your DC plans, so your 457 plans, there's going to be an additional catch-up amount. Uh, for those currently over age 50, you can do in this calendar year, you can do an extra 6,500 for a DC plan. Um, and what the House bill, said was you can go up to 10,000 per year for those ages, ages 62 through 64. The Senate has a similar approach, but different ages. The Senate would start at age 60 and go through age 63, but taking it up to $10,000. You know, an interesting uh, condition here though, is that these catch-up contributions going forward would have to be made with after-tax dollars. So that's the reference to Roth. Um, you know, currently they can be done either way, but this would, if your plan uh, allowed it, but this would require that all catch-ups be done uh, with after-tax dollars. So be aware of that going forward. Also a provision which would be helpful, I think, to recruitment 
uh, of young people's student loan repayments would be treated as an elective deferral uh, for an employer match. That's, um, that's an important provision. And then an important provision specifically for LACERA and public pension plans is what starts here in italics. So under current law, retired first responders, and I think you know this uh, quite well, have a up to $3,000 uh, annual tax exclusion from their pension distributions if the monies go directly from the retirement plan to the provider of the insurance or uh, long-term care insurance policies, health insurance or long-term care. And this has caused problems, uh, not just for LACERA, uh, but for plants across the country, because you know they, there's, there's often in situations where the carriers, the insurance carriers will only talk to the beneficiaries. Sometimes the beneficiaries are not communicating back to the retirement plan in a timely way. So things are getting lost, plus there's the administrative burden of simply doing this. So I'm pleased to say, and Barry and I spent time on this with the California uh, Senate offices and, and Louis Lugo, when he was in Washington, uh, we met with Senator Feinstein's office on this. Uh, Senator Padilla was also terrific on it and was an early supporter. But I'm pleased to say that in the Senate bill, the Senate committee reported bill out of finance is a provision to make this optional. So if, if you love this current system and your plan is not having trouble meeting this administrative requirement, then you can keep doing it. But if you'd rather simply let the distribution be paid to the retiree and have the retiree pay his or her own insurance premium, still be eligible for the tax exclusion, that would be permitted under this Senate Finance Committee bill. So there's a need and an opportunity for Lucero to engage. And I'll be talking to Barry about this. We've already talked about it a little. And that's for uh, Lucero to make sure, since we're only in the Senate bill, make sure that the House members from California, specifically those on the Ways and Means Committee, um, from Southern California. So Congresswoman Chu Sanchez and then Jimmy Gomez are aware of the importance of this provision and communicate it to the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. Because they are gonna be working on putting these uh, two bills together, uh, more than two bills, uh, and we want this provision to be retained. The final provision I'll talk about is, uh, is an attempt by Senator Burr of North Carolina to allow, and there are about six or seven criteria that has to be met, but you're essentially letting nonprofit firefighters into governmental plans if the governmental plan, uh, plan sponsor allows it. Um, the way it's drafted right now, it's giving people a lot of concern. The way it's drafted right now it appears to only apply to North Carolina. Um, but earlier versions of this, and we don't know where Senator Burr is going to land. He's, um, he is the senior Republican on the HELP Committee. He's also on the Finance Committee. Um, so he's going to continue to push this. It's not in either bill, but I wanted to just flag this for you. Generally allowing non governmental workers into governmental plans is a bad policy idea. Uh, so I just want to make sure you're aware that this is out there. And Barry, you can go to the next slide. So Social Security, um, you know, we, we spent time on the windfall elimination penalty over the years. It's I'd say there's a lot of legislation introduced. There's a there's a willingness on the part of Chairman Neal of the Ways and Means Committee and the senior Republican Kevin Brady to find a consensus. I'm not sure they can, um, but that's, you know, that's an effort that is still ongoing. Um, Barry and I will certainly raise the WEP issue as we have communications with the California delegation going forward. Barry, you can go Threats to public plans. I talked about Rothification. I mean, it's not a direct threat to a public plan per se, but it's something that you should be aware of. If it's applied only to the catch up as it is in this current legislation, 
I think that's fine. And again, we're talking to we're talking about DC plans here. Um, if it starts to encroach upon your elective deferrals, you know, the pre-catch up, just what you're taking out of your salary um, to pay your 457B, I think it, it could start to change behavior and it could harm uh, savings for retirement. UBIT, so the unrelated business income tax, we fought that battle. Lacera was involved in 2017 on the tax bill. That was a house provision to apply UBIT to specifically to investments um, of governmental plans, state and local governmental plans. We were successful in knocking that out. Uh, we could see that again in the future. The financial transactions tax has not gotten any traction. I think it's too big right now, given the market situation, it's a non-starter. You know, when the market was is churning along in positive uh, territory, it was maybe more of a possibility at a very low level, but there's a lot of concern about that going forward. But as an investment um, issue, it, it's certainly something that has been out there and talked about. There you can go on. And here, I'm just putting here in, in your minds that, you know, if we see a switch in, the congressional makeup. And this is in no way um, uh, a comment on Republicans. But in the past, we have had, uh, outside of public safety, a little less support from Republican members on public pension issues. So these are some of the ideas that have been put out there in the past. Um, in a way that there have been arguments made that state and local governmental plans are not sustainable. Um, so these are some ideas that have been put out there. You know, it's a carrot and stick approach. We will provide assistance, but you have to do certain things. You have to lower your discount rates. You have to remove your colas. Now, I don't know that we'll see any of this. Um, but we, um, you just want to be aware that these ideas have been out there in the past and, and could well return uh, next year. Barry, you can go on. And just more of the same here. The Urban Institute is, he, and you would never say that is a conservative organization. So this was an interesting report in January of this year, um, where it talked about various options for federal intervention on public plans. And, and one was full ERISA application to state and local governmental plans, funding uh, requirements, uh, discount rate caps, and then you'd be part of the PBGC um, insurance. GASB would be overseen by the SEC. Um, I know this third bullet is less important to Lucera because you already have California state uh, reporting requirements um, where you have to show your investment returns and your funded status based on different factors. Nationally, this has been a big issue. Um, PEPTA is the federal legislation. And then a closer review of these FICA replacement plans. You know, right now, if you don't pay Social Security, you just have to make sure that your plan, your state or local plan, is meeting certain requirements. Um, so there's been there's been discussion that some of the plans, some of the new tiers that have been created, could fall short of being a FICA replacement plan. I've not seen that anyone has been uh, found to be, however. But that is something that's been out there and discussed. Barry, you can go on. Yes, and, and again, you know, as we saw the ARPA legislation come into being, and that was uh, the most recent federal aid to states and localities for uh, pandemic related um, needs. You know, public pensions became a little bit of a football, a uh, political football in that. And it was, uh, it was a concern. You know, where we ended up, Barry, actually go to the next slide. Where we ended up is under the, um, the second main bullet, the two sub bullets. So you cannot deposit into any pension fund. So these are monies that go from the federal government to a state or locality. That's the, that's the law right now uh, for this pandemic related uh, purpose. And then they define 
deposit as an extraordinary payment. So that's where we ended up. Barry, I'd go back one slide now. And but but where we started was a much more concerning um, place, uh, particularly um, the third item down there, um, the third uh, quoted item, where there were members of the Senate who were saying that um, states would be prohibited uh, if they took any of the federal aid from making any changes to their state um, pension programs that would increase payments. So we were in the midst of, um, of, of concerning ground there as that legislation was being developed. I just wanted you to be aware of that. And then Barry, you can go to regulatory activities and I'll close and turn it to Shane. You know, we're still seeing regulations come out of the original SECURE Act, and I certainly will keep you up to date on, on any changes there. Uh, Treasury and IRS have been working on the def definition of governmental plan, allegedly working, since sometime in 2011. I don't know if we're ever going to see this. If you talk to the Treasury and IRS officials, however, they do say they are continuing to work on it. And there were over 3,000 public comments, but it has been 10 years. So there's ample time to go. There has been ample time to go through these comments. I, I just put it on here because it is fundamental to La Sierra and to state and local governmental plans. And then the normal retirement age rules were still waiting to be finalized. They were the proposed rule as we last saw it was, was in a, a fairly good spot. And then audits of pension plans. So this has come up more where you have a reserve fund and you're asking employers to pay more than the actuarial determined um, employer contribution, what it would be. So you're paying more as an employer because you're creating a reserve fund. And the federal government has said for their federally funded employees, which of which there are numerous, of course, in every jurisdiction, major jurisdiction, that they will not do that. So they are saying that they will not allow, um, they will not pay more than what the action, what the ADC is. And, and so states that have gone down this path are creating reserve funds from their own, uh, their own monies. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shane. Tony, I see a question from Les. Oh, I, I didn't know. very good. I, yes, Les. Well, you just, you just put so much stuff on our plate. I don't even know where to start. Um, I have a question about the after-tax dollars comment that you made. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean you pay taxes on it twice? Once when no. you put it in and then when you take it out or how does that work? No, so the, the Roth method is the reverse of what you would usually think of as like a 401k or 457. So if when, and that's called the traditional method. So the traditional method is you make a pre-tax contribution but you're taxed at distribution. <laughs> The Roth method is you make a post-tax contribution, but it's tax-free at distribution. Okay. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how much of this really is not going to apply to public employee retirees in California who are in 37 Act systems. At the same time, <clears throat> I worry about unintended consequences. Let me move for a second to the 72 to 75 age issue. You, if I understood what you said correctly, you don't think anything's gonna happen until 2032 and then they're just gonna move it three years. That's 10 I, years from now, so. I think that's the way it will end up because doing it gradually over that 10 year period is, is gonna cause, I think a lot of, administrative problems. Yeah, I, I, I get that, so, yes. I mean, yeah, so, and, and once again, well, no, I, I'll just, I'll, I'll just kind of stop there. I'm still trying to get my head around 
some of the stuff that you said, and, and, and I won't be so kind to the Republicans because I worry that if the next election they have the House, the Senate, and the presidency, I think we're in for a rough ride. And Les, on the on the uh, age trigger, if if you feel, you know, if the board feels that Lucera really should communicate to the Hill that this gradual increase is administratively, and I don't see how it couldn't be a big headache and, and cause for you know mistakes to be made. Um, we can do that as part of our communications that we're going to be making on that retiree, first responder retiree issue. So, I mean, I, I would strongly prefer this one move to 75. It seems to be the easiest for everybody. Uh, I agree with that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, my head's still spinning, so I'm going to stop talking. So. <laughs> Shane? Uh, Tony, I see Keith has a question as well. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Good. Knox, go ahead. Knox. Yeah, thank you. On the, um, the bullet point regarding the federal government um, only providing the, the ADC on an annual basis, what is the, the background to that? Are, are they the, trying to prevent pre-funding or was that just in reaction <laughs> to states using some of the, you know, the relief funds to, to bolster their their pension funds. Can you just elaborate on that a tick? Yes. Um, it's come up in a couple of ways. It's come up in the reserve fund, the creation of reserve funds. I'm aware that one state, when they changed their um, DB plan significantly um, in the new system, included the funding of a reserve fund, which of course is a conservative and prudent approach. And they had uh, put basically a surcharge on employers to, to fund that reserve fund. And when the federal government looked at that for their federally funded employees in that state, they said, sorry, no. Yeah, we're not, yes, we're going to pay the ADC. And if you want a reserve fund, then you can fund it for, you know, okay. through your it's also occurred in other states where <clears throat> they have a fixed statutory rate of employer contributions. And there may be times when the actuaries will provide a number that for an employer contribution that is below the statutorily fixed rate. And in those cases, the federal government has also objected and said, no, we are paying the actually determined rate. So we are not gonna pay what your state statute has locked us into paying. So it's um, in those cases, it's become, it's, it's well after the fact uh, always. And what happens is they don't ask the state for a refund, but they offset their future contributions to the extent that they've made up for what they believe they should never have paid. So there have been audits in various states where, where they have that fixed statutory rate. Okay, so no perceived risk to what we've been doing. Not that I see okay. at the moment. I mean, they could, not at the moment. Understood, thank you. And any other questions, comments, concerns? Well, Mr. Rota, thank you again. We appreciate your presentation and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Very good, thank you. Thank you and have a great day. And that will bring us to our second presentation. Uh, Chair Pryor, we do have Shane Doucet who wanted to talk about some of the health care. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't know if you were gonna move to me, sir. But uh, Chair Pryor, uh, members and staff, uh, it's nice to be with you uh, today. And it's somewhat of an opportune time that I'm uh, re-engaging with you as it relates to healthcare because we are seeing some things uh, move. Um, so uh, first, I want to kick things off uh, just with uh, the FTC 
um, and a recent investigation that they've launched uh, against PBMs. And this sort of goes uh, to a larger scale of the pharma versus PBMs uh, that we're starting to see sort of play out uh, here in Washington. But the FTC has been looking at uh, doing an initial investigations into PBMs uh, for several months, and they finally uh, were able to pass unanimously a vote uh, to look at uh, the six largest uh, PBMs in the United States, like the CBSs and the Optums, et cetera. And really what they're gonna be doing is going through uh, record ret retention, discovery, et cetera, to see how PBMs uh, charge unaffiliated businesses, those that are not tied to the, uh, to the actual PBM, uh, restrictions that they might put in place like prior uh, authorizations um, and so on. The, the PBMs have, have largely avoided sort of the congressional scope and other things that the pharmaceutical companies have, but uh, of, of late Republicans, and more in particular Republicans, but it's also bipartisan, have really started to center uh, on PBMs. Uh, and uh, largely, if you kind of looked at it, in general, Republicans have been more defenders of pharmaceuticals. So it sort of plays out a little bit uh, into some of the partisanships that are associated with these special interests. But I wanted to bring the PBM uh, you know, into focus with you because we, we would be more aligned with PBMs uh, and how they work with uh, insurers and et cetera, probably uh, than pharmas. Uh, next slide, please. And this just sort of is what's sort of playing out, which I can see uh, if the Republicans uh, at least take back the House, they're going to be uh, really focusing uh, on, on PB, um, PBMs. And pharma has been launching a lot of ads lately, sort of you know, targeting uh, PBMs. Next slide, please. There was a recent uh, congressional hearing over in the Senate uh, Commerce Committee. Uh, where uh, I would say it was sort of uh, bipartisan um, uh, in nature uh, and sort of looking hard into the PBM industry. And they had uh, economists um, and healthcare folks go in and talk about how, how PBMs sort of uh, negotiate these rebates that you don't see and it's, it's causing a rise in inflation and pricing. And the, uh, the PBMs are, are primarily represented by the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. And uh, this one, uh, one person that was on the panel was really the defender for PBMs. So uh, my point in sharing all this with you is that I think this is gonna be playing out to a larger degree, uh, probably in the next Congress, uh, as in particular with Republicans who will be, I think, more focused on attacking the PBMs and maybe defending more on the pharmaceuticals. Next slide, please. One healthcare bill that has to be passed uh, and it needs to be uh, done before the end of, end of uh, September is the FDA user fee reauthorization. Uh, this largely passed with uh, bipartisan support uh, in the House. And so when the Senate gets back next week, we anticipate uh, them probably bringing this to the Senate floor uh, and passing it. So I just wanted to sort of, you, bring this to your attention. There was really no big, huge divisive uh, issues that, that, uh, that came about in the, uh, in the markups, but there was some reforms that were made that I just wanted to quickly highlight with you. Next slide, please. One of the, the, the major reforms was the Modern, Modernizing Accelerated Approval Act. And what this did uh, is basically sort of address the issue that I had talked to you about um, last time when we were talking about Adelheim. Uh, Adelheim was the Alzheimer's drug that was causing uh, a spike uh, in pricing for Medicare. And that drug, Adelheim, uh, that was manufactured by Biogen went through the accelerated uh, approval process at FDA with really not really kind of, uh, you know, uh, showing clinical benefit. And so a lot of criticism was associated with that. Uh, and so the members both in the House and Senate wanted to try to do some reforms to, to make sure that certain drugs don't go, um, you get the, uh, the cart in front of the, uh, the horse and that they basically haven't been proven before they get, they get out onto market. So this sort of reigns in a little bit of the accelerated approval process, which pharmaceuticals really like 
Uh, and they were upset about how Adelham went through that process uh, and tried to enact some reform so we don't have a drug like that come into the market where it really isn't proven. And then you have associated price hikes, which we saw uh, with Medicare. Next slide, please. The Medicare trustee report uh, came out um, and uh, basically Medicare is not broke yet. And there was some good news. It was extended for another two years to 2028. Um, and so uh, when it reaches you know, 2028, if we haven't done anything, it's not completely broke. It will only be able to pay about 90% of the, uh, of the benefits. Uh, but, um, and this is really in particular to the part A uh, funding, part B is sort of self-funded. But uh, you know, the, the bigger issue is that Congress needs to do something at, at, at some point. It's been a kick the can uh, on uh, dealing with this issue. So uh, I, would, I would hope that we'll start seeing some movement to try to address this in the coming years. But this was some good news and no one really knew how the impact would be with COVID. Um, but uh, so it was somewhat of a surprise to, to, to see this. Next slide, please. So when I, when I did talk to you last, I, I talked to you about the potential increase uh, that we could see uh, in premiums uh, that were associated with Adelham, the drug that I just talked to you about for Alzheimer's and the enormous expense with that drug. So what CMS did do, uh, and I think we largely were supportive of CMS on this, is that they said uh, Adelham can only be used in certain clinical trials. So it limited, it didn't uh, allow it to go to the larger population uh, for use. And so uh, what others then came back uh, and said, okay, so if we're only gonna uh, you use it to a small cohort, then we should get that savings uh, this year. And CMS said, no, we're too far down the road to try to get the savings associated on how they treated Adelham coverage. Uh, but we'll, we will calculate that basically uh, for 2023 premiums. So we hope to see a decrease in premiums as it relates to the savings associated with, uh, with Adelham. Next slide, please. So this, this slide's a little difficult to, uh, to read, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll interpret it for you. So um, the uh, Build Back Better reconciliation bill that I had talked to you at last time about where we still didn't really not kind of know how it was gonna fare out in the Senate given how Joe Manchin uh, walked away well, now it's back in play. Uh, and literally, I was getting uh, the language uh, today for what they may do for, uh, for Medicare Part D uh, and B uh, negotiations. But the skinny Build Back Better, you know, when it started off in the House as the Build Back Better, it was more like a jumbo jet. And it's probably going to, if it does fly, you know, out of the Senate, it would be more like a Cessna. Uh, and a lot of people are calling it the Build Back Mansion. Uh, act and uh, Joe Manchin has has been in negotiations with uh, Senator Schumer uh, over the last few months to try to, try to get uh, something that he could support, and they're very close to doing that. Today, Senator Schumer uh, is sharing language with the Senate parliamentarian to see what could be made in order uh, to see if, if they can move a bill as early uh, as this month uh, that would include. Uh, some uh, clean energy uh, provisions, I would suspect EV tax credits. I think that'll be done largely in part because Democrats feel that they need to do something on climate, especially given the EPA's recent decision last week uh, where they ruled against the EPA's authority for, uh, for climate uh, regulations. Uh, so we'll also see some, uh, I suspect, some corporate tax rate increases that have always been on the table that Senator Manchin uh, can support, um, and then we'll uh, we'll also see some uh, some uh, reforms as it relates to uh, Medicare drugs, which uh, Senator Manchin and even Senator Sinema, another conservative Democrat, um, both both support. So um, that and maybe a few other items I think will be included in a potential reconciliation uh, bill. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the issue with Democrats, you know, going into midterms um, really has, I think, been, you know, they've, they've been pushing really hard to at least have something that they could run on. And the drug cost proposal has been the most popular element, I would say, uh, in, the, uh, in the bill. Um, when 
uh, the Senate uh, comes back into session next week, Senator Schumer is going to put on the floor uh, an insulin uh, bill that would limit uh, the cost of insulin to $35 per month. It's a very, very popular bill uh, with Democrats, and it does have some bipartisan support in the Senate with uh, Senator Collins. If this Insulin Act bill uh, fails, where we're, we're, we're somewhat uncertain whether they're going to get 60 votes, that's going to put even more pressure, uh, I think, uh, on Democrats to move the reconciliation bill. Um, so uh, today we just got language on what the Medicare Part D uh, drug negotiations bill would look like. Uh, and so uh, I'm going through that today, but I did share that with, uh, with Barry and a few others. So as we get more information, I'll certainly uh, share, share that with you. There seems to be just some, some minor changes that have been uh, associated uh, with, the, uh, with the provisions. It would uh, move negotiations, for example, to 2023 instead of 2024, when the secretary could start negotiating with certain drugs. Um, and then the prices would actually go into effect uh, in, uh, in 2026. Uh, so um, there's uh, some other things that were, that were, it looks like that have been taken out that relate to insulin. And I think that's because they're gonna be addressing that uh, separately. The only thing that was that I thought was contentious in what the Democrats were trying to do in the prescription drug pricing is that they also uh, were going to hammer drug manufacturers if they increased uh, their prices higher than inflation on the commercial side. Uh, and we didn't know if that was going to fit in the uh, in the budget uh, reconciliation rules. And I'm not seeing applications of the drug pricing as it relates to private plans. It looks right now to be part D and Part B drugs that you would get uh, in an office environment. So um, I'll continue to read up on that, and then we'll send any type of uh, analysis back back to you on that. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges that that we're going to be you know, dealing with, I think, with the budget reconciliation is timing. They've got to get this thing passed before September 30th, and I think they're trying really hard to get this done. Uh, in this case, uh, before they go off for August recess. Uh, and then the bird rule was what I was just sort of talking to you. That's sort of the test that they'll have to comply with uh, in the Senate, the rules. Um, and that could impact, again, on how things may apply to the private sector when it's really supposed to just have a, a federal government impact uh, on it. I think uh, Senator Cinema can be uh, appeased when it comes to corporate rate uh, increases. She's not been a fan of that. But I would suspect if they're very close to getting something done, that they could could probably work something uh, to satisfy her uh, on that. So really timing, I think, is going to be the big issue. They've got to get it done before we go into a new fiscal year on October 1. Next slide, please. I'll pick it up from here, Shane. And I'm, I know we're all pressed for time. So I'm, I would just say <clears throat> two things. And this is a long discussion that we're going to have going into the next Congress. Sometimes simple is better, especially if simple gets you where you uh, need to focus. And I would say that first bullet is where we should continue to focus, the two Senate offices and the, the members of the Ways and Means Committee from Southern California. Uh, that, that is, that's going to be the nucleus of, of our um, ability to influence legislation. We can grow it out from there, but that's the, that's the center of the target. And then the fourth bullet down, um, you know, whether we have a Republican Congress, you know, or not coming up, the interests of first responders have always been paramount to Republicans. And in fact, we wouldn't have gotten where we are today on that direct pay issue without considerable Republican support. So those, the members um, in the Republican Party are um, very much attuned to the interest of public safety. And that's something we, we need to keep in mind uh, going forward. So with that, thank you for your indulgence and time. I don't know if you have any questions for Shane. Any questions, comments, concerns? I don't have any hands raised right now. So uh, we're gonna let you go, Tony and Shane. Thank you for your report. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. And that'll bring us to item B, which is our second presentation. And that's Mr. Popovich on uh, wait times and uh, the call center. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Pryor and trustees. The Member Services Call Center Management Team is here today to discuss the trends in our recent call center experience over the last few years, including the unacceptably high wait times we are currently experiencing. I will ask Ms. Puga, our Contact Center Manager, to introduce her team in a moment. But before we do that, I wanted to say that the Executive Office shares everyone's concerns about the high wait times we're experiencing. We acknowledge that they are not acceptable and we are doing everything we can to bring them down. I thought before we got into the why this is occurring, we would take a moment and share with you the philosophy for managing the call center. In preparing the report, we felt it was best summarized as the four pillars of the call center management, which we outlined in the memo. Every call center relies on ensuring uh, the services delivered by having the right staff in place at the right time with the right tools and training to provide the service they wanna provide. So these four pillars, staff modeling, performance management, process management, and member experience optimization are all common methods employed by to manage uh, service and call volumes uh, throughout the industries. Uh, they're not new to Lucera. We have always used all of our resources to ensure we had enough staff on the phones to handle the volume while we work to maximize performance and reduce call volumes. Today, we are more focused and more cohesive in these efforts than we have ever been. I can't thank you enough for supporting Mr. Kreiman and his reorganization of the divisions along vertical business lines that allow us to focus the organization's efforts on improving service and ultimately reducing the need for members to call us. Uh, we have never been more aligned in our efforts to do this. I also cannot thank the management team enough, especially Ms. Delano and her team for their help and focus on improving process and overall experience uh, through the various programming changes that, we, that we're implementing and, and working on. And finally, I can't thank the call center staff enough including those before you today for their dedication and hard work. They're working more efficiently than they ever have, and they remain focused on our mission to serve our members. So with that, let me turn it over to Ms. Puga. Thank you, JJ. Good morning, Chair Pryor and trustees. My name is Kelly Puga, and I am the Contact Center Manager for the Member Services Contact Center. Together with my team, Renee Copeland, Valerie Kiros, and Gerald Bukako, we will talk about the call center's operations, which will include reasons why there is an increase in call volume, call duration, and a decrease in staffing. We relate these to the four pillars of call center management that were outlined in the attached memo. The correct staffing model. One of the leading causes of the current wait time is due to delays in hiring budgeted staff caused by the pandemic. We currently have 20 out of 30 agents taking calls due to promotions, retirement, and natural attrition. Performance management. We will demonstrate how we actively manage day-to-day -day staff performance, which includes ensuring staff manages calls correctly, ensuring quality, and ensuring proper techniques are being used. Process improvement. We are constantly looking at how the call center operates and how using new tools helps staff reduce the time it takes to interact with members. For example, we will talk about how we adopted the chat feature in Teams, which allows us to provide better support instantly to staff, which contributes to less talk time. Member experience optimization. We work to identify call drivers and focus on improving processes, services, and automation to drive calls down. Later in the presentation, we will cover some key projects we are currently working on to improve our services. We have also included in the appendix a slide that has call center terminology, which is commonly used in contact centers nationwide and will be used throughout the presentation today. Member Service Contact Center is one of two call centers that services Lacera members. The second contact center is Retiree Healthcare, which provides comprehensive healthcare plans and resources for healthy living beyond retirement. Retiree Healthcare will present for you next month in August. So this presentation will focus on the Member Service Contact Center. Next, we have Renee Copeland, who will first talk to you about call volumes, handle times, and abandoned calls. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, Chair Pryor and Trustees. We wanted to start our presentation by sharing an overview of call trends over the past five years. We have seen a steady increase in call volumes over the last five years. The average call volume increased from a pre-pandemic volume of 11,749 to our year-to-day average of 17,632, about a 50% increase since pre-pandemic. 
based on historical data, in 2022, we experienced the highest call volume since we started tracking in 2006. We'll address that reason uh, increase in a, in a later slide. This takes us into call wait times. This slide reflects wait times, also known as the average speed of answer. Over the last five years, we have varying increase in wait times, with our highest wait times occurring around the beginning of the year when we see the height of March Madness, combined with the annual 1099 R mailing and the annual Part B reimbursement period. There are generally four factors that cause increased wait times. Increased call volume, call volume distribution throughout the day, increased call duration, and staffing models. We have noted that the call volume has increased. In the appendix, we have also included a slide which covers our call volume distribution throughout the day and the impacts on when we receive the calls and can have a big influence on the wait time. The appendix chart will show we receive our highest call volumes between 10 and 4, and those periods coincide with break and lunch schedules for staff. We also address staffing impacts later in this presentation. The longest wait time listed here occurred during the height of March Madness and occurred during the busiest time of day. The member services team and the executive office recognizes that the current wait times are not sustainable and we will be addressing what we are doing to bring them down. The next slide takes us into call durations. As we mentioned, one of the factors leading to increased wait times is call durations. Look, the longer the calls, the less calls a specialist can answer in a day. This slide reflects call duration within the last five years. This is a period when telephone contact between the specialist and the caller is established until the specialist finish wrapping up the, the account. The average call duration during pre-pandemic was 11 minutes and 13 seconds. The average call duration pandemic was 15 minutes and 50 seconds. The specialist and management team work together to control call durations as much as possible. Recent technology innovations such as using Microsoft Teams to provide real time support to specialists on the phones are an example of internal process improvement that we use to reduce call durations and improve service. We have also set up a member services care unit to help more complex calls to follow up with members. In turn, helps reduce duration and call volumes. We also work with benefits, retiree healthcare, and other Lacera units to refine the notes they leave on account so we can better interpret statuses and help members understand what is needed to resolve their request. We also work with specialists to examine their calls and help them find ways to better manage calls with members. However, we do focus on ensuring that we provide members with the information they need to make informed decisions and will take time to walk members through complex issues or their struggles with technology. This takes us to the next slide that reflects the 11 call topics that account for 75% of calls, which would be presented by Valerie Kiros. Renee, good morning, Chair Pryor and trustees. As Renee said, this slide reflects the top 11 calls for 75% of incoming calls. Retirement counseling pre-pandemic accounted for 21% and has since increased 5% for 26% year to date. Retiree healthcare pre-pandemic was 11% and has increased to 13% year to date. My Lacera pre-pandemic 4% and has since doubled to 8% year to date. Our top six talk call topics from retirement counseling to previous service are our longest duration calls, while the last five are our faster account maintenance calls. The next slide reflects our top three call drivers during the months of January to March, better known as March Madness, that account for nearly half of the calls during this annual busy season. Number one is retirement counseling. These calls can average from 30 minutes to an hour and a half because the counseling is in-depth and catered to each member. Retirement benefit specialists cover 23 top 
needs during the counseling session that cover reviewing service credit, ensuring there is no missing credit, verifying eligibility, how to optimize their benefits with buybacks and previous service, and providing all retirement options the member has to choose from which often leads to many retirement estimates being ran with multiple what-if scenarios to ensure that the member is completely informed before making this life-altering decision. Number two is retiree health care. These calls average about 10 or more minutes. Retiree health care calls are increasing and retiree health care cannot answer the call volume and it's increasing call duration. So member services is assisting by answering general questions what documents can be submitted for Medicare Part B verification and how to submit those verification documents. Rounding out our top three is Myla Sarah. These calls average 15 minutes where members are calling to either enroll in their Myla Sarah portal, have their passwords reset, or how to navigate through their self-service options. Now that we've covered call wait times and what is driving those call wait times, we wanna shift over to productivity and staff performance. This graph shows the number of calls taken overlaid by our staffing levels. In January 2021, you see an increase of staff where our last pre-pandemic class graduated from the core benefits training mid-pandemic and the member service center were assisting on the phone lines. Since then, there's been a gradual attrition and in January 2022, many of our call center staff promoted to other key positions in Lucera. This was vital for Lacera to do because those positions help increase the productivity behind the scenes, which then in turn helps decrease the incoming calls. As of today's date, we have 20 staff members and scheduled to have 19 at the beginning of August with one additional retirement. Also shown is a slight increase in productivity from staff working from home. Staff are taking up to two calls more per day. And while two calls per day may not seem like much, Two calls more per staff per working day adds up to 700 more calls answered per month. This slight increase is very important because as the call volumes increase with longer call durations, normally you would see a reduction in the productivity, but staff are increasing productivity, which means we're handling calls more efficiently. Appendix slide 21 reflects that even though our call volumes have increased and our staff has decreased, our quality has never wavered. And to discuss performance management, occupancy, shrinkage, and forecasting, I'll hand it over to Gerald Bublikow. Thank you, Valerie. And um, good morning, Chair Pryor and trustees. Um, before we go any further on how we've increased productivity per staff, in this slide, we wanted to share with you how we monitor and manage the performance of our call center. The screenshot you see here is an image of our Amazon Connect dashboard, and the bottom box covers staff status. Through this, agent activity is monitored throughout the shift and supervisors can determine if staff is on contact, on after call work, on hold, on break. And as you can see on the bottom box, we also have some staff here on project and you can also see their average after call wait time and, hand, and the calls that they've handled throughout their day. Along with staff activity, we monitor the call activity constantly through the day um, when we adjust trainings, meetings, and even break times in real time, depending on call volume and on staff activity. The top box is where we see incoming calls and service levels and our calls in queue. On top of monitoring our shift, another main focus we have are employee engagement activities that are conducted in the call center. And we prioritize communication with our staff through daily check-in meetings, monthly staff meetings, one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions and ad hoc meetings and huddles to ensure that staff are constantly in the know on any updates, we can answer any questions they may have and share best practices within teams. Moving on to the next slide to continue to further elaborate on how we've achieved the increased productivity, the answer is really twofold. First, we wanted to cover the occupancy, which is the amount of time that our staff is engaged with members throughout their day. Pre-pandemic, we averaged 75.2%, which is in line with industry best practice, which calls for occupancy rates between 65 and 85% of a staff member's day. Our goal is set at 65% because we understand we need to schedule time away from calls for training, development, culture building activities, as well as any other coachings that we may need to give our staff, as well as give our staff a slight break or breathing room in between calls, 
because we, as we have mentioned earlier, we cover a lot of calls that require more than just transactional help. Currently, we're averaging 98.2%, which means staff members are interacting with our members for almost their entire working day. This is another example of how staff's productivity has increased and staff are working harder than ever before. Where pre-pandemic, we've only achieved a high of 85.57% one month out of the last five years. This year, we've averaged 98.2% for the first five months of this year. The second aspect that has helped staff productivity is our shrinkage, in particular, our absenteeism, which is represented by the blue line on this graph. Absenteeism has declined significantly. This is another indicator that our staff has, are highly dedicated, engaged, and more productive working remotely. Across the board, we're seeing staff are calling out sick less. We have noticed a decrease in tardiness, both at the start of the day and coming back from breaks and lunches. We have less FMLA claims. And in particular, to working from home, staff are requesting time off in smaller blocks. So instead of asking for full days or half days off to handle their personal business, they're basically taking an hour or two to, to handle their business, coming back to their homes to log in and help us clear our queues. Also, we've seen a staff uh, willingness uh, to stay later to answer calls post their shift because they don't have to worry about their travel time to get home. To reiterate the point in the previous slide, one of the reasons we target an occupancy rate between 65 to 85 percent is to help reduce staff shrinkage caused by the stresses of intense call volumes. Our goal is to fill our vacancies in the call center, improve the member experiences through the initiatives that we are working on now to reduce the call volume, and to help preserve the bump in productivity we have seen while our staff has been working remotely. Also, as discussed previously, we also lost a significant number of staff uh, due to necessary movements and promotions within LaSera. Although historically, we've preserved a very low attrition rate and most of the staff um, that have left us really are getting promoted or transferred to different positions in other divisions. Um, now that we've covered the key points and causes of our challenges this past fiscal year, we wanted to give you a glimpse of expectations of what we foresee will be coming in the next two years. This slide contains a graph of, which is a snapshot of the last five years call volume plus the projection and calls over the next two years and the staffing needed based on these projections. Based on historical data and current hiring practices and headcount of active employees in the county, we have seen a steady growth rate in the call volume, in particular 2.2% the past 10 years, 5% the last five years, and 9.6% per year the last three years. This fiscal year, we, uh, 2021, we saw a total of 182,036 calls, which as we mentioned, is an all time high for a call center. Um, we are sharing this to illustrate that if we do nothing to reduce the calls and help member experience, we may see a conservative 5% increase in call volume, which can equal to up to 192,000 calls for fiscal year 2022, and up to 201,000 calls for fiscal year 2023. Again, it's very important for us to point out our goal is to apply the fourth pillar of call center management, which is optimizing member experience, where we're, we have ongoing projects in partnership with other divisions to help reduce the need for members to call us, reduce the number of repeat issue calls, and to reduce the call duration. Now I would like to hand it off to JJ to expound on the current and future efforts we have to decrease call volume and improve member experiences. Thank you, Gerald. So as you can see, we continue to apply the four pillars of call center management in our efforts to provide the level of service we expect to provide our members. There's no doubt that hiring delays due to the pandemic is one of the leading causes of our wait time. Key to our being able to handle the call volume is to ensure we have the proper staffing model. And we're currently running two core benefit training classes, which at the same time, to train as many new staff members as we can to get them onto the call center as quickly as we can. 11 of the 23 trainees will be assigned to the call center with the remaining going to the member care unit and benefits, which are both critical to moving member requests through the back of the house quicker, reducing repeat follow-up calls and improving service. In line with improving the member experience, one of the steps we've taken is to reevaluate the training needed for retirement benefit specialists to work in our retiree healthcare. As a result, we removed them from the, the core benefit training program 
And the Retiree Healthcare Group has created a shorter, more focused training uh, program, which will shorten the time it takes to bring their staff members online. This will increase their ability to take more calls, reducing some of the overflow that member services is currently handling. The re-engineering project for the death benefit claim process outlined by Interim Benefits Division Manager Carlos Barrios in a previous Operations Oversight Committee meeting will shorten the time to issue claim forms, again, improving uh, service to our survivors and beneficiaries and reducing repeat follow-up calls. MyLacera calls for resetting passwords and helping members log into MyLacera are one of the higher call durations that we field. Multi-factor authentication will help improve member ability to complete password resets with staff assistance and improve their login experience. And we expect to see this go live in the next couple of months. We also have a number of Lacera.com enhancements, such as improving instructions for uploading documents. We noticed that members were struggling with uploading documents, so we went and re-engineered uh, the explanation process to help them understand that better. Reducing call volume from members requesting assistance for that and other self-service improvements, such as providing how-to MyLacera, uh, how-to videos for how to log in and use MyLacera, and sample forms for retiree healthcare enrollment. Our debit card program, which we outlined previously, will eventually reduce or eliminate the need uh, to handle lost check calls, which will reduce the call volume. Let's take a look at some of the things that we're doing in the future. So we're always looking forward to what we can do to improve the member experience and to limit that call volume and the duration of calls. Uh, we are coordinating with uh, human resources to ensure a steady stream of trainees to meet our needs. This includes starting a recruitment in July uh, this month for a new class scheduled to start near the beginning of 2023. And we're looking at overhiring to ensure we have adequate staff during recruitment and training. Since it takes us so long to bring staff online, if we overhire slightly, uh, we'll be able to smooth out that transition. The case management solution is another major improvement that would allow staff to have better access to the status of member requests while helping our, our back of the house reduce processing times and reducing follow-up calls. We continue to look at enhancing staff efficiency and the member experience. We're scheduled to complete an RFP for a new call center system this year, which we hope will allow us to offer AI assistance to staff during calls, making suggestions and reminders on key points that they need to cover with members, as well as taking advantage of AI-assisted validation, validating members prior to speaking to a specialist could reduce a minute or two minutes of our call time. We're looking at a hold your place in line function, which would allow members to hold their place in the queue, hang up and go about their business, and then get, back, uh, get a call back when it's their turn. Our current Amazon Connect system doesn't support this function, but we are working with Amazon to try and find a way if we can mimic it using their technology. Enhancing Lacera.com and more how-to videos and possibly adding AI-assisted chat may help us reduce call volumes by improving service. Re-engineering our new member onboarding process by moving the new member sworn statement process into MyLacera will help establish an electronic connection with the member at the beginning of their career. And that allows us to help encourage them to use self-service functionality that we develop over time. And it will also be, uh, approve our, excuse me, improve our ability to electronically communicate with members. Uh, that, that, that function will help reduce calls over time. And then finally, we'd like to consider expanding our call center hours. As we discussed, our highest call volume periods coincide with break and lunch schedules. Spreading the call volumes across a longer period of time will help prevent this call bunching and allow members to have better access uh, to our specialists. And it might be especially beneficial for members who can't take the time away from their jobs during the day. So let's take a look at the summary of where we're at. Let's go to the next slide, please. So what does the data show? Continual trends of high call volumes and an unprecedented spike in 2022. Call volumes are driven by four main categories, retirement counseling, insurance calls, benefit payments, and MyLacera. The largest call drivers are retirement counseling, which is also the highest duration. And that's the focus of what we do is help our members. So there's a continued call trend of higher duration calls. What does the data show about productivity? Well, staff are, making, are taking more calls than they ever have before. Occupancy is off the chart, showing staff are working nonstop helping members. Shrinkage is way down, meaning staff are engaged and working hard every day, uh, and, and that's a huge uh, benefit to being able to take more phone calls. And the call center staff are working more productively remotely than they were while they were in the office. Continuing to focus on those four pillars of call center management, consistently recruiting and keeping a consistent pipeline of, of new staff members coming in 
to uh, address the attrition and the promotions that we see, implementing improvement projects uh, to uh, optimize the member experience, reducing the need for them to call us, reducing the call duration by having more information available to, to our staff members, and then taking advantage of our technological innovations to improve service every step that we can are all ways that we're going to, to focus on helping to reduce the call volume, keep it down, and also uh, improve our, our call duration. So with that, we'll stand for questions. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kehoe, you're first up. Thank you very much. Um, I, I definitely want to show my appreciation to staff on this presentation. Um, it's very detailed, provides a lot of information. I don't want to downplay the amount of work and effort and energy that went into the presentation. But I'd like to highlight that somebody was on hold at the beginning of this presentation and they're still on hold right now. And if they sat through this entire presentation and watched, it would not have solved the issue that they're having to sit there on hold on the phone. I have never received so many complaints from Lacera members as recently. I've gotten tons of phone calls of people complaining about having to wait um, significantly 30, 60, 90 minutes. It, it is an issue. Um, there are two major things. So one, hearing that we're looking at a callback option is completely unacceptable. This should have been done within 30 days. The fact that we're still looking at it is unacceptable. We need to resolve that immediately. The callback option will solve most of the complaints. People that have the option to put their phone number in and say, call them back when available, rather than sitting on the phone for 30 or 60 minutes and then getting disconnected. And the next call is me when they're upset about that stuff. Um, we, need to, we need to resolve that issue and allow them to get back on. Um, that, I, I understand there, there's some technical issues, but the bottom line is our organization the size, the scope, the resources, completely unacceptable that we can't get that result. So that needs to be a focus. The other thing too, is I heard a lot of discussion about uh, decreasing the number of people that are calling in. I, I don't think that that should be our focus on just decreasing call. I think I understand the, the concept, but I like the ability for our retirees um, to be able to call in and to be able to talk to somebody and walk them through uh, some stuff uh, and not have to worry about doing everything online or through uh, online means. Um, there are definitely some things that I think that we should look at as far as right now, um, not everything should be handled by a re retirement benefit specialist with a year long training. Uh, we can have simple uh, tech staff to help out with uploading documents and answering basic questions like resetting passwords and things like that. And that should have a much less call time. So maybe a, a way to get them to the right office so that the right people help them out. I have had calls from people that were having issues with uploading documents, especially the uh, more elderly <laughs> population and family members of retirees having issues with that. So the, these are things that I think we could do uh, in-house and, and uh, resolve. But I think number one, callback option needs to be handled like ASAP. Uh, that, that is just a no brainer. And it would solve 90% of our upset people. And number two is, is work, look at a way that we can um, perhaps compartmentalize some of these issues so they could be handled by uh, individuals that are more, um, focused on specific issues rather than a more broadly ranged retirement benefit specialist. Um, so I, I pass that on to staff. I appreciate the work. I understand the workload. I understand what's going on on that, but there's some basic stuff that we can resolve some stuff quickly. And I'll uh, turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Uh, would anybody like to respond to, uh, there's several issues Mr. Keo has brought forward. I, I don't know if, uh, JJ, you'd like to respond, or Kelly? Um, I'll, I'll take it. Um, Mr. Kehoe, I definitely agree with you, the callback option. Um, this is something I wanted to do as far back as pre-pandemic. Um, our system then uh, couldn't really handle it uh, efficiently. Uh, I was shocked and dismayed when 
Amazon came back to me with their solution. Uh, it, it's, um, it's designed for extremely large call centers, uh, which can have uh, extremely um, large multiple queues with multiple staff handling it. Uh, and it's not industry standard. So we are working with them. Uh, we've had, I believe, uh, three to four calls within the last uh, couple of weeks uh, on that topic with them to try and figure out how we can use what they can provide us to mimic that callback feature. Uh, and so I hope to have something for you shortly on that because I agree with you. That is a huge help and um, it's industry standard. And it's something that I want very much to be able to provide to our members. Uh, we will look at, um, at the other suggestions for distributing calls. Um, I, I'd have to do some more research and what staff and what other areas can handle those calls. Um, but we will definitely um, take a look at that and report back. Thank you, sir. Mr. Santos. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to echo uh, Mr. Kehoe's uh, comments. I do also appreciate the detailed uh, presentation by the staff, uh, but I am also getting uh, calls uh, like Mr. Kehoe. Uh, people are waiting just way too long and uh, when they get frustrated, who, who are they gonna call? They're not going to call Mr. Kreiman. They're going to call me, uh, and they're going to call many of us. So um, I echo all the comments and support for his suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. JJ, thank you for uh, the report. I, I share Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Santos's concern, although. Uh, as an appointed, I don't get these calls. And it's disappointing that Amazon can't offer us a technological solution, but I can't help but wonder and therefore want to ask, why can't we simply have a person answering calls, taking messages and having callback? It worked in 1982. It seems to me that it would work in 2022. David? We'll definitely, yeah, no, I'm sorry. We will definitely look at, at, at the feasibility of, of doing that. Um, we, we did uh, try something like that when we had a via pre-pandemic. Um, so I'll, I'll revisit a more manual process, absolutely. I, I agree, a, a technological approach would be preferable, but you looked for it and it doesn't seem to be available. I would go low tech. Mr. Lugo. Yes, Chair Pryor, and again, I wanna also thank uh, JJ and the staff for putting together this presentation. One of the things I do wanna note is the duration of calls. So, um, you know, we will look at the callback feature and some options, but one of the issues is even if we allocate one staff member and they're on a call for half hour to an hour, that, that, that takes up their, you know, the amount of callbacks they can handle. But to uh, trust the Kehoe's point, maybe we can um, extrapolate some of those quick, quick hitters. I like the change of address, some of those, change of beneficiaries. So JJ and I will certainly look at that. The other item is, you know, as uh, the staff mentioned, we have a staff of about 19 taking calls. Um, by September, the fall, we'll have an additional 11 staff members that will be allocated to the member service center that'll go to the, uh, would have graduated the 10 month uh, call center training. So while um, we wanna get this resolved right now, there is, um, you know, staff support on the way in the next um, couple of months, but we certainly are gonna take some items between now and then to, to see if we can um, reduce some of that wait time. Thank you. And any other questions, comments, concerns? Yeah, Chair, Chair Pryor, I'd like to make a comment. Mr. Kreiman, go ahead. So I, I think that, um, that what, what I'd like to say is that, uh, that we, we all uh, agree that the, white time, the wait times um, and the call volumes are um, at a level that are unacceptable to not only the trustees, uh, but also to our staff. And so we will definitely look into uh, trying to figure out whether or not we can adapt the uh, Amazon uh, call uh, forwarding um, or call wait time uh, feature um, so that we can address the concerns that, um, that Trustee Kehoe has about individuals waiting on the phone and then getting cut off 
or drop calls. Um, I think that uh, that um, I did read an article about um, Disneyland um, that was referred to me by uh, Trustee Kehoe about you know people can tolerate wait times as long as they can do something productive during that wait period, and so that's the uh, the focus that we're going to have moving forward. Um, we we do uh, have uh, staffing limitations, and so training a a staff person to be proficient um, at their their job is uh, time consuming. It does take ten months. There have we have multiple multiple plans. I don't have to tell you all about the, the number of plans that we have, but there's a lot of intricacies for each individual um, plan. And then we try to provide the customer or our members with the service that they need and all of the questions that we try to answer all of their questions, which causes them um, some extension in the amount of time that we spend with them. But we know that there has to be a combination of um, staff, um, uh, call call in interaction, and also some technological solution that we can leverage. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. Uh, just briefly, I, I linked a article that tells you how to put a callback feature in Amazon Web Services. So I'd encourage uh, Lucera staff to take a look at that. And I would also encourage uh, Lucera staff to keep us updated, at least for the next several meetings and, until we call it off to uh, keep us updated on wait times and anything, uh, any new implementations that might help things. And I think keeping better informed of this is, uh, is a good idea. As Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Santos have pointed out, we, we do get phone calls and keeping us in the loop sure helps. So thank you, not seeing any more calls, uh, calls, uh, requests to speak. Uh, we'll move on with the agenda. So we're actually up to uh, disability retirements to be held in closed session. Uh, let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. Chair, and then, uh, Chair um, Pyre, would you like to entertain the item, the items for staff review and good of the order by any chance? Oh, and, oh I do have to do good of the order. Uh, items for staff review, do, do we have any? Yes, we have three items. The board requested that the topic of investment recruitment be agendized for discussion at the next meeting. Okay. Uh, we also requested updates on member services uh, wait time that was just presented. And lastly, the board requested that the fiscal year end staff education and travel report be agendized at the August board meeting and quarterly thereafter. And that concludes items for staff. Thank you for that. Yeah, so let's go to, uh, sorry about that. Let's go to good of the order. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, rest assured, the tax collector hears quite frequently from people that spend too uh, much time on hold. Uh, so I feel their pain. Thank you. Ms. Gray. Ms. Gray? Oh, nothing. Good morning. Good afternoon. Have a great week or have a great month until I see you again. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Uh, thank you. Uh, Appreciate the presentation by the staff and the consultant uh, regarding the federal legislation. Um, want to remind everyone that uh, uh, coronavirus uh, B4 and B5 is running around like crazy in LA County. Uh, my department is already demanding uh, or implemented, I should say the requirement that we all need to wear um, masks while we uh, work. Uh, so it's it's coming. Well, let's all be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, I have no comments. Mr. Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. I just want to thank staff for <laughs> their reports. Uh, specifically, thank you, Mr. Lugo for uh, uh, your memo uh, dated June 29th. It was uh, uh, under item seven, uh, subsection C. So thank you for all the information and for following up. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Kehoe. I have nothing, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Um, one quick thing, when we granted service connect disabilities, we granted a survivor benefit to the wife of a deputy sheriff 
And I didn't want to pull it off the consent calendar because I wouldn't vote against the case anyway, but I did want to mention the fact that uh, it was very conspicuously not mentioned in the disability file that this individual was not vaccinated. He's a deputy that died um, October of last year. Um, <coughs> and I've done a little research on the department and nobody really wants to talk about it, but um, he was not vaccinated. And I just think it's important to bring this stuff up. It's sad he left a lot of money on the table for his wife. 51 years old and 23 and a half years of county service, and she's not going to get near what she could have gotten had he lived at uh, the age of 55 or 56 or 57 and retired with 30 years of county service. Anyway, uh, I just want to bring that up. I think we should keep an eye on the, on the uh, survivor benefits that we do grant that are a result of somebody passing away from COVID-19, especially when they're not vaccinated. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Harris. No, nothing for me. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Nothing for me. Thank you, uh, Laura Guglielmo. Okay, nothing to report. JJ Popovich. Nothing to report, thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen Rice. Nothing, thank you. Louis Lugo. No additional items, thank you. Thank you, Santos Kreiman. And nothing from me. Thank you, and Chair Pryor. Thank you, and I just wanted to thank everybody for today's meeting. Uh, I know we have some vacations coming up the next uh, few months, and I want to uh, hope I hope everybody has some good quality time off with themselves or their families and their families. And um, I did want to reflect uh, Mr. Santos and Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Hmm. Oh. Mr. Santos and Mr. Robbins' uh, uh, warnings, uh, definitely a, a resurgence of uh, the virus out there. I was unfortunate enough to catch it four days ago, and uh, it was not a fun four days, I'll tell you that. Uh, I am fully vaccinated and boosted times one, but I, I guess I should have been boosted times two because uh, I, I definitely caught it. So um, catch up on your boosters, uh, wear your masks and be careful out there. And uh, hopefully this too shall pass. So uh, let's move on to closed session unless we have any other items for the agenda, uh, agenda or uh, round table. Uh, Mr. Pryor, I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, we're still gonna have the uh, joint uh, BOI and BOR meeting after this. Yes, it is uh, agendized for 1030. It looks like we're running late for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe we have to conclude the agenda before we can start that meeting. Okay, I, I may have to leave early. So go ahead. Understood. I'll let you know. Um, I, I, that's my understanding that we have to finish the agenda. I don't believe we can take a break and take that meeting and then start back up. No. Yeah. We'll see. I don't think. I, uh, uh, Chair, I, I thought that we do have that ability. We, but I believe we've done that before. Yes, by action, um, the board could um, adjourn this meeting to a or recess rather this meeting to a to a time certain. Uh, uh, I, I, I prefer like not motion. to. I think we're on the verge of finishing up the the yeah. uh, service connected disability cases, but I'm I'm willing to hear other options. I just want to make sure, Mr. Chair, if I may, I just want to make sure that we do have a quorum uh, for the yeah. both boards. And, and if not, perhaps uh, Manny could advise us if, if, the, if Mr. Moore has to leave, do we still have a quorum? We do. Or, okay. Thank you. Bonnie, how, how, many, how many folks from the Board of Investments do we have waiting? So we have two, and we did send out an email with an approximate start time of 11.15 to 11.30. We oh, do have okay. six cases on the in-closed session. I appreciate that. Thank you for thinking ahead, Bonnie. And I will, um, let's go ahead and start our cases then, and we will keep an eye on an 11.30 uh, end time and um, uh, uh, official start time for the uh, combined meeting. Okay. 